Thank you so very much for joining us this morning. This is a wonderful turnout. It's a, a wonderful day, and we appreciate you appreciating literature. Thank you so much. My name is Marsha Bonhart. I'm an anchor with WDTN, the NBC affiliate here in Dayton. And I'm going to serve uh, as sort of as your MC, but you know, this is all about the author. So they're, they're going to take everything away in just a few minutes. I was thinking this morning uh, just about books and magazines and newspapers and just anything, you know, that even includes the, the back of cereal boxes. I'll, I'll, I'll just read anything. Um, but I was talking to a friend of mine early this morning, and we, we went to high school together, and we were talking about the great classics and what we read in the 10th grade and what they're reading now. And, and, and now they're reading The Kite Runner as a classic and, and Night as a classic. And, and that's all well and good, but we, you know, I'm dating myself right now when I talk, started talking about how we had to read Great Expectations and Ethan Frome and The Scarlet Letter and, you know, and it just, and we were trying to remember all of the things about Les Mis and, you know, of course, the, the book and, you know, how things change with movies, but uh, uh, A Tale of Two Cities and just those great old classics and just how, how things have shifted and things have changed and reading has changed and um, you just move along with the times, but um, to us, he and I were talking, and just in our 60s, there's nothing greater than those great classics, and I'm sure the people who were born way before us felt that there was nothing better than their great classics. So as long as people are reading, I think that is what is important. I tell young people all the time, when I go to different schools to speak to different classes, um, I tell them, read. I don't care what you read. Just read something. Read, pick up anything and read it. Read Sports Illustrated. You don't have to read War and Peace if you don't want. I think a lot of young people um, are intimidated by books that are bigger than that, <laughs> you know? And I tell them, that's okay, I just want you to understand how words are connected and the pictures that these words create. And I, th I, I think, and that's, my mom always told me growing up that reading makes a ready man. Well, that was a long time ago. Now it's reading makes a ready person. But we want to be PC all the time. <laughs> so, and I, I just feel that reading just prepares you for so much. And I don't have to tell this audience that certainly, but I get so excited when I become involved with, with words and people who love words and, and books and magazines and newspapers. So I'm very, I, I, you think I'm excited to be here? <laughs> yeah. Sort of. <laughs> this, is, this is absolutely wonderful, and I'm, I'm real, very pleased to uh, share this with you. Um, I'm going to tell you also uh, how this is going to occur this morning. The authors will share information about themselves, their books, and then we're going to open the conversation for questions from the audience. So uh, all of you will have an opportunity, and there are microphones at this aisle and a microphone at that aisle, so you guys will be able to queue up and uh, ask the, each, each one of these uh, fine authors a question or just to throw one out for any of, any of the authors too. If you want to be specific, that's fine, but if you want to ask a general question of, of the authors, that's fine as well. Um, just, a, just a brief reading here. The Dayton Literary Peace Prize honors writers whose work uses the power of literature to foster peace, social justice, and global understanding. Launched in 2006, it has already established itself as one of the world's most prestigious literary honors and is the only literary peace prize awarded in this country. As an offshoot of the Dayton Peace Prize, the Dayton Literary Peace Prize awards a $10,000 cash prize each year to one fiction and one nonfiction author whose work addresses themes of peace as a solution to conflict and leads readers to a better understanding of other cultures, people, religions, and political points of view. An annual Lifetime Achievement Award is also bestowed upon a writer whose body of work reflects the prize's mission. Right now, uh, I also want to remind and to mention to all of you that uh, you can purchase any of the books, and the books will be signed by the authors. Right now, I'd like to introduce the founder and co-chair of the DLPP, Ms. Sharon Rapp, who has some commendations to read to you, also to introduce you to the president of this fine institution in which we are sitting, Dr. Stephen Johnson.
Thank you, Marcia, and thanks for being with us this morning. This is wonderful that you were here. And I cannot tell you, here we are in our eighth year, and it is so wonderful to be here at Sinclair. Um, the first year we did the Sunday morning readings, I think we had a group of the board and three other people. You know? <laughs> so, so this is absolutely fabulous to look out and see that we've been discovered by all of you, and I know you're going to really enjoy this morning. Um, this, this group of authors is absolutely amazing, and I can't wait for you to meet them. I do want to read uh, accommodations that were sent uh, by the governor to each of the winning writers this year, and I thought maybe I could do a, a blanket good job, but he actually has them all personalized. So, um, Gilbert King. Uh, John Kasich and Mary Taylor, the Governor and Lieutenant Governor of Ohio. Uh, today we join your family, friends, and colleagues in congratulating you for the recognition of your work, Devil in the Grove. You have positively impacted the lives of your readers, and it's our hope that you continue to use your writing as a way to influence social change and understanding in our society. On behalf of all Ohioans, we congratulate you upon this memorable occasion and we extend our best wishes to you in the future endeavors. John Kasich. <clears throat> Adam Johnson. As a writer, you've promoted peace and humanity and we're proud to recognize the caliber of your work and the importance of its message. The Orphan Master's Son represents the power of the pen, which is why you are a deserving recipient of this honorable distinction. It is our hope that you will continue to use your writing as a tool to endorse global understanding and social justice. And we look forward to witnessing the positive impact you will have on your readers for many years to come. On behalf of all Ohioans, we thank you for your contribution to influential literature, and we extend our best wishes to you in all your future endeavors. Andrew Solomon. The time and commitment you have given to this project is a testament to the passion you have for the children and families affected by cognitive, physical, and psychological hurdles. Far from the tree, parents, children, and the search for identity is a story that touches readers and seeks to implement a permanent change in the way we understand those who are different from us. The stories you tell beautifully portray a message of peace and appreciation and it is our hope that you will continue to use your words as a means to advocate for a better world. On behalf of all Ohioans, we extend our best wishes to you and all your future endeavors. God bless. <laughs> Wendell Berry. Excuse me. <clears throat> as a recipient of the 2013 Richard C. Holbrook Distinguished Achievement Award, we are honored to join those in attendance today in recognizing your body of work. Your words have influenced thousands upon thousands of readers, representing the importance of literature and the power it has in shaping our society. As a farmer, your writing has, of, has often served as a source of advocacy for living in harmony with the land and with one another. And it is our hope that your work will continue to promote peace and understanding for many years to come. On behalf of all Ohioans, we congratulate you on this wonderful occasion, and we extend our best wishes to you for all your future endeavors. And now I would like to introduce uh, Stephen Lee Johnson, who is the president of Sinclair. Uh, Stephen Lee Johnson has been uh, 11 years as president of Sinclair, and uh, we have, have come to know him well at the Dayton Literary Peace Prize because he's such a wonderful advocate for us. He is now uh, in his 14th year as Sinclair, 11 years as president. In the last few years, he has been honored as the leader of the year for the Dayton region. He's also been honored as the Humanitarian of the Year for the region. And he is one of the region's 
12 most influential people. And I can attest, and everybody in this room can attest to that because we've seen him in action. He's led St. Clair in population growth. They are now 40,000 40, students strong, which is a wonderful tribute to him. He's also known for the regional growth. He's added uh, three new learning centers, and he has opened uh, the Warren County campus. So there's been a lot of change here at Sinclair, and I think you can witness it as you walk around both here and as you drive around our area. We totally appreciate your, your support of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, uh, and thank you for that kind introduction. You missed the, the part that I was president of my eighth grade class three years in a row. Three years in a row. <laughs> uh, Marsha Bonhart, as always, it's nice to, to be with you, and thanks for, for helping us today. And to all of you, welcome to Sinclair. Uh, to the authors who were uh, recognized by the governor, uh, that, is the, that is the great news. That's the great news. The, the little bit of the downside is now that you're citizens of Ohio, you need to pay taxes here. <laughs> and so, uh, which aren't that bad. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. Good morning to all of you. It's great that uh, you are here with us here at, at Sinclair. At Sinclair, we are honored. Uh, to host this morning event, and on behalf of the, the faculty, the staff, and the students of St. Clair, uh, we, we certainly uh, are, are very thankful that the uh, Dayton Literary Peace Prize uh, chooses St. Clair for, for this part of the event. We're so proud of our Dayton region. We're so proud of the fact that we have the first and only Literary Peace Prize in the world. We are so honored by the authors who are with us today, uh, who are so incredible, and their body of work uh, is incredible. I, I have to give a shout out to Wendell Berry, by the way. Just, I'm here, I got to stay, I got to just say, shout out. Uh, 30 years ago, your book was one of the most important, uh, your, your book, Gift of Good Land, the collection of essays, one of the most important books I ever read. And so I just want to give a shout out, so. <laughs> I, Thank you, sir. So as, uh, as one of the nation's oldest community colleges and serving 40,000 credit students a year as we do now, uh, it, is, uh, it is great to be old at 126 years of age, but it's also great to be fresh with all these fresh new ideas that, uh, that you bring to us. So if there's anything we can do to make your time here more pleasurable or more productive, please let any of us from Sinclair know. Thanks again for being here and have a great rest of the day and we'll see you tonight too. Thanks. Thank you to Sharon Rapp and to Dr. Johnson. Thanks very much. And also to let you know that a panel of prominent writers, including Ken Bodie, Christopher Cerf, Michelle Latiolis, and Maureen McCoy, reviewed the 2013 finalists and selected this year's winners and runners up. I'm going to introduce our panel of writers. And uh, after I introduce each, uh, they're going to say a few brief words about their book. And also that Mr. Christopher Cerf is going to have a, a chance, will give all of you a chance to hear interviews with these, with these authors. He's going to ask them a few questions. And then after that, that is when the audience will have an opportunity at each microphone to ask questions. So Mr. Cerf will handle those duties this morning. Fiction winner Adam Johnson. Adam Johnson is a novelist and short story writer whose work has received wide acclaim, including the 2013 Pulitzer Prize for the Orphan Master's Son. New York Times critic Michiko Kakutani called the best-selling work a novel that not only opens a frightening window on the mysterious kingdom of North Korea, but one that also excavates the very meaning of love and sacrifice. Adam Johnson. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. What a fantastic place. What wonderful, wonderful people. Thank you, Dayton. Thanks to everyone who came out today. Uh, and it's a great honor to be with such a table of writers, uh, heroes. Um, I wrote a book set in North Korea. It's a novel. Um, I'm a fiction writer, so I used fiction. Uh, it's a place that's difficult to write nonfiction about and journalism about because it's uh, almost impossible to confirm anything about North Korea. Um, and it's a case where I think the imaginative reach of fiction could actually leverage a portrait that is difficult in other genres. Um, 
Uh, I became fascinated about North Korea for many reasons. One of just my curiosity of narrative, um, and the narrative of North Korea is just the opposite of our American narrative. Um, you know, here in America, uh, in our novels and movies and in our own lives, we're each encouraged to be the central character in the story of who we are. And I think we don't question that. It's about you, right? I mean, I know you love your mom and your spouse, but it's about you. Um, and our, our Western narrative is very simple. Um, you're a person and you um, are encouraged to look inward to your desires and your yearnings and to use them to project a, a future possible self that, it, that attains those things, that's a better person. And you go down a path toward this imagined self, you encounter obstacles and conflict and challenges and you overcome them and thus make choices and decisions and actions that reveal and enact who you are and you become yourself. You look inward, you look to the past, you consult others and in kind of a, a growth event, you, you embody this person you want to become. And in the end, you've gained understanding, growth, wisdom, and change. Right? Isn't that what life's about? Yeah. <laughs> But as I began studying North Korea, I realized it's just the opposite there. There's one central character, and his name is Kim. And there's 23 million secondary characters. And their job is to make him, the central character, even more glorified. And it doesn't matter what they want out of life. They tell stories, the defectors, about you know people from Pyongyang coming into their schools to ascertain their aptitudes. And, other people decide whether you're gonna be a fisherman or a ballerina or a factory worker, and your own yearnings actually get you into trouble there. Your own desires will run in conflict with your given role. And so people are taught to quash their search for meaning, to quell their own communications, and to just follow a path that's made for them. And in my novel, I just wondered what it would be like if someone tried to live their life in a way that we're used to, you know, who tried to develop his own narrative and desires in a system like that. Thank you. Thank you, Adam Johnson. Nonfiction winner Andrew Solomon. Andrew Solomon is the author of two New York Best Time Sellers, Far From the Tree, Parents, Children, and the Search for Identity, and the winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award, The Noonday Demon, an Atlas of Depression, which won the 2001 National Book Award, and a Pulitzer Prize finalist as well. The Noonday, De the Noonday Demon also made the Times list of the 100 best books of the decade. Andrew Solomon. Thank you very much. I just want to echo how very honored I am by the prize, by the company I keep on this podium, um, by um, the enthusiastic appearance of the people of Dayton at this event this morning. So thank you all very much. My book, uh, Far From the Tree, Parents, Children, and the Search for Identity, is about the idea that, uh, that there are really two kinds of identity out in the world. There are vertical identities, which are passed down generationally from parent to child. Um, so one's ethnicity, one's nationality, one's language, frequently one's religion. And that those identities tend to be reinforced by society. People can describe some of them as difficult, but nobody attempts to cure them or make them go away. And that there are other identities which parents don't have in common with their children, which I've called horizontal identities because they're identities that are learned from a peer group. So um, being gay, being deaf, being autistic, um, uh, being transgender, there are many different groups that fall into this category. And I really wanted to look at how those identities have time out of mind been uh, cured or contained or attempts have been made at least to eliminate them and to look at the struggles of people who have those kinds of differences uh, to establish uh, a place in the world. So some 20 years ago, I was asked by my editors at the New York Times Magazine to write a piece about deaf culture. And at the time that I received the assignment, I had no sense that there was such a thing as deaf culture. But I went out into the deaf world, and I spent time at deaf clubs. I went to deaf theater. 
Um, I went into homes where pets spoke sign language and the alarm clock flashed lights. I even went to the Miss Deaf America contest in Nashville, Tennessee, <laughs> where people complained about that slurry Southern signing. <laughs> And, <laughs> and as I threw myself deeper and deeper into that world, I became more and more convinced that deafness was a culture. Not only that it was a culture, but that it was a beautiful and in some ways a seductive culture. Um, the deaf community, actually since I finished my book, but I've been following it closely, uh, established the idea that we hear a great deal about hearing loss and too little about deaf gain, which they posed as its opposite. And, I felt when I was in some of those contexts with deaf people, I felt envious of their deafness. It wasn't that I in any larger way want to give up my hearing, but that in those moments, I felt like as I watched conversations um, conducted by hands flying all over the room, I found them deeply seductive, and I thought how wonderful it would be to be able to participate in that world. And then a friend of a friend of mine had a daughter who was a dwarf. And it turns out most dwarfs are born to parents of full height. And as she began to describe her concerns, do I tell her she's like everyone else but a little short, or do I bring her up with some kind of sense of dwarf identity? As she narrated those concerns, I thought, here it is again. Here it is again, this thing that you have a, a culture which, um, uh, uh, which is foreign to a parent. And I thought, how do parents manage to achieve in the face of these kinds of differences? How do they manage to achieve love? And how do they manage to achieve acceptance? And love is something that I think should ideally be there from the beginning. Parents feel it for infants who are newly born. It grows and strengthens through childhood. But it's nonetheless something unconditional and constantly present, at least much of the time. Some people aren't very good at expressing that love, but my experience is that most people love their children. But acceptance is a process, and acceptance takes time, and it's difficult for families to arrive at acceptance. And I wanted to chart the narrative through which these parents managed to arrive at acceptance of these children. I wanted to draw on my own experience as a gay person, looking at what I had once thought were deficits in my parents' love, but what I had come to understand were only deficits in their acceptance. And really to look at the larger question of how these categories of experience, which are generally defined by much of the society as illnesses, can in fact emerge as identities. How does someone develop a deaf identity? How does someone develop an identity as a dwarf or a schizophrenic? Um, or how does a family create identity around having a child with multiple severe disabilities? What kinds of identity are involved in the world of crime? And how do parents respond to children whose difference is not how they were born, but what they choose to do. And how do parents who are bringing up children conceived in rape look at the drama and the difficulty of having had such children and find in it an impediment to love and yet the capacity um, for love itself. So that was really the scope of my examination. And I wanted to look at um, the glorious dignity of people who are at the margins in one way or another and see how they achieve authentic dignity. Thank you, Andrew Solomon. Nonfiction runner-up, Gilbert King. Gilbert King is the author of Devil in the Grove, Thurgood Marshall, The Groveland Boys, and The Dawn of a New America, awarded the 2013 Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction. Thomas Friedman of the New York Times called it a must-read, a cannot-put-down history. King is from Schenectady, New York. He has written about race, Supreme Court history, and the death penalty for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Pacific Standard. Gilbert King. Thank you very much. Looks like it's on. Yeah, there it is. Uh, so my, my book is called Devil in the Grove, and I think a lot of people recognize Thurgood Marshall as the first African-American Supreme Court justice. Some people know that he was the, he argued the landmark Brown versus Board of Education, the, the famous segregation case. But a lot of people don't realize that in the late 1940s and early 50s, he was involved in some very dangerous criminal cases where he was the defense attorney. And he would travel down south, often alone, and take on these to kill a mockingbird type cases where people's lives were at stake and men were about to be sent to the electric chair. And so this book, Devil in the Grove, is really 
looking at Thurgood Marshall's life as Mr. Civil Rights, as he was called, um, through the lens of this one dramatic and sort of forgotten criminal case. Um, this was a case that was on the front page of all the Times, uh, New York Times, of all the newspapers across the country, even around the world at the time. It made it to Russia because this was a, a perceived as a great civil rights violation. You had the sheriff and the Klan taking the law into their own hands. Thurgood Marshall and his young African-American lawyers with the Legal Defense Fund were in danger constantly, having to be moved from house to house during this case. And it was a very dramatic case that most people really don't remember. It doesn't show up in a lot of civil rights texts. It doesn't show up in Thurgood Marshall's biographies because they focus mostly on, um, on the landmark decisions in his Supreme Court case. And so I went back and just looked at this case, and it, like I said, it's, it's sort of imagining Thurgood Marshall as Atticus Finch and what that would be like taking a case in the South when you had the, restrict, the restrictions of Jim Crow, so you could not question whether a white girl's word was factual or not. You had to take on the case differently, different legal strategies, because all you had to do was inflame the jury, uh, and that there would be no sympathy. They would just send your client right to the electric chair. So those were the kind of uh, factors that went into this case, and I was able to get a lot of the files from the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund and examine the strategies and, and, and what Marshall was working towards and his young lawyers working towards through this particular case. And they, en they ended up raising hundreds of thousands of dollars on this particular case. It funded Brown versus Board. And a lot of people didn't realize that. So that's it, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gilbert King. I'm pleased to introduce the 2013 Richard C. Holbrook Distinguished Achievement Award winner, Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry is the author of more than 50 books of poetry, fiction, and essays. He was recently awarded the National Humanities Medal and the Lewis Bromfield Society Award. For more than 40 years, he has lived and farmed with his wife, Tanya Berry, in Kentucky. He is also one of today's most fearless and eloquent cultural critics. His essays on issues ranging from the economy and globalization to marriage and national security have become modern day manifestos, influencing a generation of writers and activists. Wendell Berry. In my youth, I read a statement by a very authoritative literary person to the effect that writers in general are very, very bad people. <laughs> and uh, that really caught my attention. And I've been watching now for about 60 years, I guess, to see what kind of people writers are. <laughs> And uh, his statement, uh, in my experience, has been very rarely confirmed. Um, and again here, these, uh, uh, the refutation has been made available. I, I know that my colleagues up here didn't come in more than I did to reveal their flaws, and I assume they've got them. But you can hear it time after time how their work is coming out of their goodness. And uh, they, they, they're not going to be able to fake being good people all the way through this. I think they're good people. I'm really... <laughs> I'm really glad to be up here with them. Now about my work. Um, my work as a, as a writer has been a long effort, starting in ignorance and continuing in a lot, uh, with a lot of awkwardness to discover and understand uh, what my, my work is. And um, it took me a long time to see, and I'm still, still coming to see, that m my work, that, that I was stuck with by birth and by history has been the story of the decline of uh, rural life in our country. And by that, and I know from what I've heard and seen, 
in, in much of the world. And um, by country life or rural life, I don't mean just the human life. I mean the natural and the human life. It, the decline has been continuous and heartbreaking throughout my life. And it's to understand that, that I have, have uh, done my work. And the teaching that I've finally understood and, and take most to heart is that you mustn't talk about the land and the people as two different things. It doesn't work. My, my best piece of evidence, uh, or the one that I have readiest to my mind now, is that in 1963, uh, my fellow Kentuckian, the, uh, the, and a great mentor, Harry Caudle, wrote a book called Night Comes to the Cumberlands that drew attention to the poverty in eastern Kentucky, among other things. And uh, what that book did, its practical result, was to bring the war on poverty to eastern Kentucky with the net result, uh, after all these years, that poverty has continued pretty much without a break ever since. And the, my conclusion from that is that you can't help the poverty of people while you allow their land to be destroyed under their feet. And, and uh, the people, I think, are the most effective in opposing poverty and or uh, the abuse of the landscape are the people who know that the two live together and survive or, or not, thrive or not together. Thank you to the 2013 authors. And the authors will be joined on the panel by Tim O'Brien, the 2012 Lifetime Achievement Award winner. And Maza Mengiste, the 2011 fiction runner-up for Beneath the Lion's Gaze. Thank you for joining us this morning. Now I would like to introduce Christopher Cerf, who will moderate the Q&A session. He's the author, editor, composer, lyricist, record and television producer, and co-founder and president of the educational media production company, Serious Thinking Limited. He has won three Emmys and two Grammys for his musical contributions to Sesame Street. And if you get a chance, if you get a chance to get close enough to him later today, check out his tie. You'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Mr. Surf, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an incredible thrill for me to be here. In addition to the part of my biography you heard, I grew up loving books. Uh, my dad was Bennett Surf, some of you will remember, who uh, <laughs> I'm saying that because uh, literature has been part of my life since I began to breathe. And to be on this panel with these incredible writers is a big thrill for me. So I don't want to get in the way too much. I'm just going to kick this off. I, I wish I had time to ask really individual questions to everyone, but that would leave no time for you guys. So I'm just going to throw out a general question that I hope uh, has some things in common for all of you. and then see who wants to pitch in an answer, and then we'll turn it over to you guys. What, what struck me as really interesting about a lot of your work is that a lot of it is based on research, and in some cases, of course, in real life experience, but somehow in the storytelling part of that, or the narrative part of that, it becomes advocacy, either up front or behind the scenes. And I'm really interested in how all those things go together. So a question I'd like to throw out is, is what came first and are there cases where research, uh, like in your case, Adam or Gilbert, or certainly Andrew's case, did it change your opinion? Did it 
make you more of an advocate, or did you start with the advocacy and and find the research that fit it? Uh, and did the process of writing change your views about any of these things? So I just throw that out to any of you that would like to take it on. They're all looking oh, I'll start at with you, Adam. <laughs> yeah, they won't know how you need it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll field that briefly. Uh, I've always been a writer who writes from research, um, even fiction. I know that sounds strange. Why would you research stuff that you're going to make up? Um, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it, if the job of, you know, a literary narrative is to transfer a, a particular human experience from one person to another, then the verisimilitude, the, the small realities that, that form humans are very important. And it's not just, you know, window dressing to make something seem authentic. It's uh, the little attributes of our environment that, that form us, that matter. Um, and, you know, I wrote a short story about um, people in Hurricane Katrina and, and a hurricane just within a month afterward, Hurricane Rita, that was actually stronger, the strongest hurricane to ever strike the, the Gulf um, Coast. And, uh, you know, just to write a short story, I went and lived in Louisiana and interviewed people, dozens of people, for weeks before I felt confident enough to speak from the experience of another. And, Whenever you ride outside your own experience, uh, you're taking a great risk, you know, because you might get other people's lives wrong, even if they're fake people. That feels like trespass, let alone if you're representing another culture or history or, 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 or something else. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm a believer that it's a great empathetic act you can do is attempt to speak from the voice of another. Um, you have to try to uh, understand every aspect of someone else's life. And, um, but you have to do your research really well uh, to try to pull off that, that illusion. Um, I, I, tr I wrote my first piece of fiction this summer um, ever without research. Um, you know, uh, uh, the lives of sex offenders is, is a big issue in my neighborhood in San Francisco. And, you know, I just tried to capture a perspective that we almost never hear, honestly. Um, and uh, in interview I found very difficult. Um, and I was just afraid to type any of these words into Google, honestly. <laughs> you know, honestly, yeah. Um, child pornography, child sexual images, any of these things. I was just honestly afraid because of the, of the system we, of information gathering we have in this world. Mm -hmm. And I, I honestly felt I had to write almost completely from imagination. And I, I found it um, very lonely and a very uncertain act. Great, I just would love to ask you, well, you're about to answer anyway. Yeah. Uh, I really got swept into the world of research, I think, because I found the world an interesting place and uh, found the variety of human experience very interesting. Obviously, nonfiction requires uh, a lot of research. When I was growing up, I thought I would write fiction, and I tumbled into a magazine job, which ultimately led to my working in nonfiction and uh, spent time in the Soviet Union, which led to my first book about a group of Soviet artists and had their lives changed. And I want to take the idea that you put forward of activism and the question of activism. Um, I had grown up with ideas about what the Soviets were like. And then I went there and found out that that wasn't what the Soviets, at least who I was meeting, were like. And it was a transformative experience meeting um, at these extraordinary artists and um, witnessing their integrity. And uh, it began me on a path that I've been on since. I then wrote a lot about depression and did a book about depression and became something of an activist there too. And people kept saying to me, but if you write about depression, don't you find it difficult to be so exposed and so vulnerable? And I said, depression is the family secret that everybody has. And the process of talking about it is what will allow all of the people who are carrying out only the burden of a terrible mental illness, but also the additional and confounding burden of secrecy um, out into the world. I always think of the statement by Harvey Milk, the gay activist, who when someone asked what he could do for the gay cause said, go out and tell someone who you are. Um, I think it's by communicating those things that we bring about change. 
This book involved doing an enormous amount of research on people who do not have um, uh, the civil rights that they need to have and should have. And it became a very driving interest of mine to try to bring about any change that I could in those worlds. And when I interviewed people over and over again who had told me very painful and difficult stories, I would say, why did you choose to talk to me when this is clearly so difficult for you? And they would say time and again, I felt very alone in these experiences, and if I can help someone else to feel less alone by describing what happened to me, then I'm happy to do the interview. And so I felt a kind of burden of responsibility to those people whose motivation for talking to me was a form of activism of their own, a quiet, private activism. I wanted to help them in that enterprise, in that endeavor. I wanted to be an activist myself, and I would like to see a world in which the full provisions of existing legislation, such as the ADA, are actually enforced and realized, and a world in which people who are different in all of these ways achieve actually the general social acceptance to which many of them aspire. And so I ended up feeling like an activist for that. And as I worked on the book, I ended up getting involved in activism for some of these causes. I'd written about people who are transgender. I joined the board of Trans Youth Family Allies. I wrote about the gay experience. I joined the board of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. I got involved in different ways with the Little People of America, with the National Association of the Deaf, and so on, because I felt there was such impetus to do something that merely describing wasn't action enough. And um, so the book inspired me to greater activism. It became the center of a kind of activist view of the world. And it's my deepest hope um, that it will have that effect on other people. I'll close just by describing one conversation that I had in relation to my last book, the book about depression, that was very telling. I had set out to research depression among the indigent, and um, or as the APA said in a typographical error, I was fond of depression among the indignant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I went off to look at depression among um, uh, people who were economically disadvantaged. Now, if you're um, having a terrific life and you feel awful all the time, it occurs to you that you have a mental illness and you go and seek help. But if you have a bleak life and you feel awful all the time, the way you feel seems commensurate with the way your life is. And it doesn't occur to you to go off and seek help. Um, and so an enormous number of people who are impoverished and depressed are not diagnosed. It doesn't occur to them that they have an illness. And often it's not that they're depressed because their life is so difficult. It's that their depression prevents them from doing what they need to do to improve their lives, which is what they really would like to be able to do. And there was an academic pilot program I came across that was screening um, women who were uh, economically disadvantaged um, in the inner city and trying to pick up depression in them and bring them into treatment. And I met a lot of these women and the transformations they'd gone through seemed to me to be nothing short of astonishing. There were people who had been in unbelievably terrible shape, living in abusive relationships, lying in bed all day, and so on and so forth, who then, after six months of relatively inexpensive and easy treatment, um, were utterly transformed. As one of them said about being picked up in this particular study, um, I asked the Lord to send me an angel, and he heard my prayers. And having had those moving experiences, I went to talk to people in Congress because I thought not only is it in our humanitarian interests to help these people, it's also actually in our economic interests because they re-enter the productive economy, uh, their children begin paying more attention at school, they're less likely to go into um, the justice system, there are all kinds of reasons why this is an advantage. And I met with Pete Domenici, Republican of New Mexico, and Paul Wellstone, the late Paul Wellstone, Democrat of Minnesota, to discuss the problem. And I said, why aren't we doing anything? And Domenici said, well, we live with a line item budget, and we can't take money this year out of um, uh, programs for juvenile justice and put it into this. And Congress resists mandates, especially in health care. And he had this whole list of things that he said. And then Wellstone said, we live in a representative democracy. And in a representative democracy, everyone, all the voters, have representation here on Capitol Hill. But the people you're describing aren't voters. On election day, they're at home with the covers pulled over their heads. And no one else knows about them, and no one else cares about them. And it would take too much political capital to bring about change unless there were some voters who were eager for it to happen. So if you want that to shift, the only possible way is for you to tell those stories so that voters will begin to care. 
And I thought that. Thank you. That was an invitation to the idea that writing could be a form of activism. And I felt determined from that day forward to try, not that I've brought about enormous political change, but to try to give voice to people um, whose voice needs to be heard by those who are actually in a position to enact change. Great. Before I throw it open to you, which I'm going to do in a minute, I'd just love to ask Wendell, who's been such an incredible activist and has written in so many different formats, whether it's poetry or essays or fiction, uh, th that same question. But specifically, in your case, has an event or something that happened to you or that, that you've become excited about, in, like the Vietnam War, for example, which you did some wonderful writing and work about, has any event triggered a piece of writing specifically for you, or is it more or less just all one thing that you keep upon, that you keep drawing ideas out of? Well, the story I mentioned before is the event, I suppose. And people call me an activist, and I'm, uh, I feel humbled by Andrew's description of his activism because he is a real activist. I'm a kind of a reluctant activist. <laughs> I don't like meetings, and I've been to hundreds. <laughs> um, and w what impresses me about all these meetings I've been to, I've left most of them with the perfect conviction that it amounted to nothing. <laughs> And uh, what I can't get over and can't deny is that in the aggregate, they've amounted to quite a lot. They've made change. And the submission to what I have found to be a fairly dull sequence of, of <clears throat> meetings um, is that that they've been necessary, they've been rewarding. And I'm glad to accept at the end of them all the reward and be grateful for it, but I don't think I'm going to go to any more meetings any, <laughs> any more gladly than I've been to the others. <laughs> so I I've, I've, have been maybe more of a spokesman than an, than an activist. I've been the kind of guy who some group would call on to make a speech. And so I would go and speak, or I would go and demonstrate, or I'd go and march, or that sort of thing. Uh, that leads to research, uh, and I've got to qualify my, definite, my understanding of myself as a researcher in a minute too, but it leads to research, one, for fear of embarrassment. Um, <clears throat> Two, because you don't want to be caught wrong by the other side. It's, it's a, a very bad blunder to be caught wrong in public. <laughs> Certain people have caught me wrong in private and made me sorry, but uh, it's not too much of a, it's a very tolerable blunder. I live about 50 miles from the nearest research library that could, could really help, and I've had sometimes to have recourse to, to the library. And uh, there's some questions that interest me that are probably going to take me back to the library again, if I live. Um, but I discovered something. I don't, have a, 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 I don't have a computer. I'm kind of well known by now for not having a computer. And if you're known not to have a computer, people who have computers send you printouts. <laughs> of things you ought to know. <laughs> this is a sort of... Uh, this has to pass as a sort of miracle, I think. 
It also raises the question of how many ugly pages you want to read in your life. <laughs> so I have read a lot of things that have come in the mail very attentively and underlined and so on. But I also have, I'm, I'm married to an editor who's getting better all the time. Um, she's been practicing on me. <laughs> and um, she has forced all, a lot of errors in my writing. I also have a brother who's a lawyer and uh, who served uh, two terms in the state senate and has a lot faster and in some ways much better mind than I do. And so anything I'm going to say that is the least uh, bit political, I sometimes will show it to him if I have doubts. And uh, sometimes he'll say, uh, Wendell, I agree with everything you say but maybe we better talk. <laughs> 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 or sometimes you'll say, hold on, wait a minute. Or sometimes you'll say, let them have it. <laughs> and I have a, a, a friend, Wes Jackson, who is a scientist. And I am by no means a scientist, but my advocacy has carried me into scientific issues. And uh, so when I'm virgin over into science, I call up Wes or I send him a manuscript and I say, can I say this? And he will take issue or he'll say, yeah, you can say that. So I, uh, that's, that's um, my history as a... Uh, an advocate and a researcher. Your heart gets you into advocacy. And your mind had better come pretty close behind. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful.